Before we start to get into this subject, I just want to make a small adjustment to the title. Because the Middle East is the most intense region of conflicts on the surface of the earth. There is no other territory like the Middle East is at the moment for conflicts. <coughs> and what we're going to do tonight is look at what's going on there, look at the causes of it, look at some of man's attempted solutions for it, and then see how the Bible not only predicted that these things would happen, but sets forth God's solution. It's set forth in his word that we might know that he has a purpose with this earth and with man upon it. So, let's have a look at a map of the Middle East and start thinking about what's going on there. Let's start in the West. Um, Libya. Libya has been in a state of chaos since the fall of Colonel Gaddafi, with various groups vying for control of the, the country. The most recent development is that a group claiming to be part of ISIS has established itself in the east of Libya. And it has a plan and a purpose. This was taken from an ISIS website. This isn't going to work me up. There we go. This is why they're there. Because Libya's got a long coastline. And it looks upon what they call the southern crusader states. That is to us the southern countries of Europe. And there's a constant traffic of refugees, as we all know, going across the Mediterranean, many of them not making it in rickety boats, trying to get to Italy and the other southern European countries for, for refuge from the troubles in the Middle East and in North Africa. And what these ISIS people are saying is we can get our people on these boats, and get them through the checkpoints, get them into your cities, and then cause pandemonium. And Libya is awash with armaments. Just imagine what would happen if ISIS got hold of, say, a couple of motor torpedo boats or a destroyer and started sinking oil tankers full of oil in the middle of the Mediterranean. Just imagine the, the economic, the political and the ecological consequences of that. Well, that's their plan. And because of that, the Egyptian army has gone into eastern Libya to try and root these people out and try and destroy them before they put that plan into practice. But that's not the only problem that Egypt has. Because Egypt also has a conflict on the other side. There are a couple of jihadist groups in the Sinai Peninsula who want to restore the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, who want to get President Morsi back as the Egyptian leader and depose General al-Sisi, who is the current President of Egypt. And the Egyptian army is fighting, not very successfully, in, in Sinai to try and eliminate these groups. And then just a little further north, there's Hamas versus Israel. It's interesting to notice that an Amnesty International report published today has come to the conclusion that firing mortars and rockets against the civilian population of a neighboring country is actually a war crime. You know, they've, they've accused Israel of a lot of war crimes in Gaza, but now they've, they've said the other way. So, Hamas and Israel, ongoing, unsolved, despite several attempts by the Israelis to, to quell Hamas. And then a bit further north, Hezbollah, the Shiite, backed, the Shiite group backed by Iran in southern Lebanon, who also are rocketing Israel and, and seeking to get the Golan Heights back, among other things. And then there's the civil war in Syria part of the Arab Spring that began in 2011 to dethrone Bashir Assad but he's still there in 2015 much of the country has been destroyed its infrastructure its archaeology things that have existed for thousands of years have been just pulverized by the warfare and on it goes with no end in sight then we've got the conflict between the Kurdish Peshmerga and ISIS. The Kurds were part of Iraq and they've broken away and are seeking to establish their state of Kurdistan and ISIS want that territory. 
So there was a conflict going on there, and we, we saw the battle for Kobani recently in the news. And then we've got the Iraqi forces who are trying to push ISIS back in their own territory of Iraq. Mainly Shiite militias backed by the Iranians. General Hassim Soleimani has been in there directing operations with the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. At the moment, they're trying to take back Tikrit, Saddam Hussein's old city. Been at it for a fortnight, not making very much progress. Again, the news today is that the Iraqi government is asking the Americans, and the Americans are responding with airstrikes against Tikrit to try and dislodge the ISIS fighters from the city. That's a very interesting situation for America, as we shall develop in a bit. And then there's the Jordanians following the burning by ISIS of their pilot, who are also battling against ISIS, who are sitting on their border and threatening to take over their territory. So all of these conflicts are going on in that central area of the Middle East. But that's not all. Abu Bakir al-Baghdadi, who is the caliph of the Islamic State, as he has appointed himself, and it's an interesting name because Abu Bakir was the name of the first caliph upon the death of Muhammad. When they had to select a leader, they selected that man, Abu Bakir, who was Muhammad's friend and confidant, and he was the first caliph. And this man has taken his name, and al-Baghdadi is of Baghdad, because Baghdad historically was the seat of the Islamic Caliphate, and this man wants to restore it and rule over all Muslims from Indonesia in the east to as far west as you like. An Islamic Caliphate. But that's not his only objective. He wants Rome. Not Paris or Berlin or Vienna. He wants Rome. Because Rome is the seat of the Western Christian religion, which he is seeking to wipe out. Because that's where the Crusaders came from, into Muslim lands. <clears throat> Back to our map. And the next conflict, I don't know what news you've seen today, but this one is just exploding. Yemen, again part of the Arab Spring, the president was, of 30 years was deposed following an uprising. He had been fighting the Houthi rebels in the north of Yemen who are Shiites, same side as Iran. But once he had been deposed, he went and aligned himself with those Houthi rebels who have now taken over two of the main cities, two of the three main cities of Yemen and are heading for Aden. And here's the news from today's Guardian, in case you haven't seen it. Yemen is exploding because 100 Saudi aircraft, backed by about 50 other aircraft from Sunni Muslim countries, have been bombing the Houthis, bombing the airport that they have taken over in the capital, Sana, knocking out their air defense systems because Saudi Arabia does not want a Shiite Muslim state on its southern border and is determined to push these rebels back. And the rebels are backed by Iran. And so what is breaking out in Yemen now is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia, armed to the teeth, and the Iranians. Last 48 hours, price of crude oil has gone up by 8%, 6% overnight. That's the situation in Yemen. And that's not the end. Bahrain, where the vast majority of the population are Shiites, but the ruling family, the ruling sheikhs, are Sunni, and they are determined not to allow the Shiites to have any handle on the levers of power. And so they've been destroying Shiite mosques and locking up activists and quelling the uprising of the people. Again, part of the Arab Spring. And before we finish, let's not forget Afghanistan, because although Britain and America have pulled out of Afghanistan, the conflict's still there. The Taliban are still trying to overthrow the government and impose their brand of Islam on the whole of Afghanistan. 
Now, I don't claim for a minute that's a complete list, but there's 11 conflicts that are going on in the Middle East at this moment. Why are all these conflicts happening? Well, we, we've seen some of the reasons, but let's do a quick summary. Egypt versus Libya is political. Who controls the country? Egypt versus the Islamists is political. It's also religious because the Muslim Brotherhood want to get back into Egypt. Hamas versus Israel is religious, Muslim versus Jew, and is also territorial. Hamas are vowed to destroy the state of Israel. It's part of their constitution. As Hezbollah versus Israel. In Syria, it's, it's religious because Bashir Assad is allied with the Shiites, and most of the rebels are Sunnis, including the ISIS group. It's also political. Who's going, which group's going to rule Syria? The other battles against ISIS are both religious, Sunni versus Shiite, and territorial, as ISIS seeks to expand and the surrounding countries seek to push it back. Yemen is a, is a straight religious conflict between Sunni and Shia, as is Bahrain. Afghanistan, it's religious. Which brand of Islam do we follow? And it's territorial. The situation is complex. There are many different groupings, each with their own agendas. So what can be done to bring these conflicts to an end? Some of the powers outside the Middle East have got vested interests because this area supplies a great deal of the world's energy in terms of oil and gas, energy on which Western and Eastern nations depend. And there's a huge amount of trade, particularly arms trade, with these rich Middle Eastern countries that the West profits from. So there are all sorts of vested interests outside the region. So what has man attempted to do to bring peace to the Middle East? Well, let's just have a quick review. We'll, we'll start back in 1947 when Britain gave up the mandate over Palestine because Britain could not solve the Jew versus Arab problem in Palestine. And the United Nations resolved in Resolution 181 to partition Palestine, to make a Jewish state and an Arab state side by side and leave Jerusalem out of the mix and make it an internationally controlled city. That plan was never implemented. The Israeli War of Independence of 1948 took place and the map was the way it was at the end of the war. And the surrounding Arab countries didn't like that. So in 1967, they decided they would change the map. And particularly Egypt and Syria and Jordan went to war with Israel. And that, of course, be that conflict became known as the Six-Day War. Uh, and the Arabs did not succeed. Israel, in fact, expanded its territory, taking large areas off the Arab states. <clears throat> that resulted in the United Nations bringing out a number of resolutions calling upon Israel to return to its original borders and give up the territory that it had acquired by force. So intending to bring peace, we'll have a look at one particular area of that in a minute. 1973, the Arab nations tried again on Israel's holiest day, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. They came over the Suez Canal and from other directions and attacked Israel. And Israel almost lost. They were actually in the position when they had two Phantom F-4 bombers painted totally in black with no insignia, sitting on the end of the runway with their engines running and nuclear bombs in the bomb bay with their fuses primed. That's how close it was. So the Americans tried to make peace with the Camp David peace accords. The Russians went into Afghanistan to try and control that unruly country for their own ends. After nine years, they gave up and pulled out. And then 1980-88, the Iran-Iraq war, Sunni versus Shia. And the West was on the side of Saddam Hussein at the time. Saddam Hussein was a good boy who was fighting against the mad mullahs in Iran. And the West backed him with arms and material. But when he went into Kuwait, the West changed its attitude. And Gulf War I ensued and the Iraqis were driven out of Kuwait and pushed back in their own country. 
the Madrid Peace Conference was another attempt to, to bring peace between Israel and the Palestinian Arabs, followed by two Oslo Peace Accords, followed by the Americans going into Afghanistan. And then in 2002, the Bush Roadmap to Peace, and we'll have a look at that in detail in a minute. And then Gulf War II, when the West became convinced that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and he must be removed, and removed he was. And the chaos that is today Iraq is the result of that. Now, in 2005, Israel complied with part of those United Nations resolutions Israel withdrew from Gaza and allowed the Palestinians in Gaza to set up their own state. The result was a democratic election, which the West applauded until they realised that Hamas had won. And then they cut off aid, because that's not what they wanted. 2007, Tony Blair was appointed by the Quartet of Powers, the United Nations, the United States, Russia and Europe, to be Middle East peace envoy, to shuttle between the parties and, and negotiate peace. And in 2012, Fatah and Hamas came to an agreement, the fruits of which we have yet to see. So man's solutions have been a combination of attempting to negotiate peace and armed intervention. And none of it has succeeded, as we have seen from the map. Eleven conflicts active, some of them absolutely raging in the Middle East at this time. Let's just pick up two of those items. There's the summary of the Bush roadmap of 2002. And look at the, the high-flowing language, performance-based, goal-driven, clear phrases, timelines, target dates, benchmarks, reciprocal steps, security. And it's all going to bring peace by 2005. Now, ten years ago, and there is no peace. The Bush roadmap did not lead to peace. And the appointment of Tony Blair as Middle East peace envoy, well, the news last week was he's sort of quietly stepping down from the post. And there's comments, not by me, but by a couple of ambassadors and state officials on his performance in that job. It was not a success. Because man has no answers. But there are answers. And they are in this neglected book, the Bible. So what we're going to do now is open our Bibles and see that, first of all, the Bible foretold the current Middle East situation and then see what God is going to do about it. And we're going to look at four passages each under those two headings. So let's start off and see that what we have on that map, that situation of conflict and trouble in the Middle East, was clearly predicted in the Bible. Turn with me to the prophecy of Ezekiel and chapter 28. And here's the first of our four prophecies. Prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 28, was written round about 600 BC. So, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, roughly. So, Ezekiel 28, we're going to start reading at verse 24. And there shall be no more a pricking briar unto the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them that despise them. And they shall know that I am the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, When I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they were, are scattered, and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell safely therein, and shall build houses and plant vineyards, yea, they shall dwell with confidence, when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Now, most of that prophecy is still future. It hasn't happened yet. But a couple of key elements have happened. We now have an Israel on the map again. 
after almost 2,000 years. I know that Harper Collins published a map a month or so ago of the Middle East which did not show the state of Israel for, for whatever political reason they did that. But Israel is there on the map. And the nations that are round about them, to use the phrase that's there in verse 24, despise them and don't want them there and want to destroy them and want to push the Jews into the sea. Those conditions have to obtain before the rest of the prophecy can be fulfilled. There has to be an Israel. And you know that before David Ben-Gurion stood up in May 1948 and proclaimed the independence of the new state, very, very few people knew what it was going to be called. And the first stamps had printed on them Hebrew Post because the, the post office didn't know the name of the state until Ben-Gurion announced it shall be called Israel. And it had to be called Israel because Bible prophecy after Bible prophecy speaks about Israel being in that land in what the Bible calls the latter days. So Ezekiel 28 tells us that Israel's going to exist, and it does, despised by the surrounding nations. Come forward with me now to the prophecy of Zechariah and chapter 12. Jonathan quoted part of this in his prayer. Zechariah chapter 12 and we'll start reading from verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. There's that name again. Saith the Lord which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. These words come from the creator of the heaven and earth. The one who in the beginning made man in his own image. Christadelphians believe that God is the creator. I was, I was interested to read um, in an article by a medical doctor who, who totally believes in evolution. And in this article he said, um, at the moment we have no robust theory of a biogenesis, which being interpreted means we really don't have a clue how life began on the earth. Although they're convinced that evolution happened. The Lord, who stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundation of the earth, and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I, he says, will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all people of the earth be gathered together against it. And again, this is a prophecy about future events. We've seen that man has tried to negotiate peace accords. He's tried military intervention, but he hasn't succeeded in bringing peace to the Middle East. And this prophecy, and other prophecies in the Bible, tell us that there is going to come a point where the nations of the earth decide we are going to implement the final solution, and I use those words deliberately, to the Israel-Palestine conflict. We're going in there, and we're going to deal with Israel. And they're going to be in the siege against Judah, which is the name the Bible uses for the present state of Israel, and against Jerusalem. And right back in 1947, the United Nations recognised the difficulty of the problem of Jerusalem and didn't include it in the territory of either the Jewish state or the Palestinian state. They said Jerusalem's going to be an international city. Actually, they didn't say that. They said Jerusalem is going to be a corpus separatum. Anybody know Latin? A separate body. Why are there two Latin words in a resolution from the United Nations in New York? because the ambassador of the Vatican City, the Pope's ambassador, insisted on those words being put in. Because the papacy would like to control Jerusalem. And they saw this as a step in that direction. And Pope John Paul, in his 
papacy appealed again and again that Jerusalem be taken out of the Middle East equation and uh, I could run it for you basically but Jerusalem is the problem how can one city be the capital of two countries at the same time when the holiest place of Judaism and the third holiest place of Islam are the same place in that city what the Jews call the Temple Mount. There is no solution, no human solution to that problem. We'll see in a bit that God has his solution. So the Bible identifies Jerusalem as the key issue, the very core issue of the whole Jew-Arab-Palestinian problem. So there's two passages from the Old Testament. Let's go forward now to the New Testament, the Gospel record through Luke and chapter 21. And here we have a, a sequential prophecy from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, in which he is outlining to his disciples a whole series of events which are going to come to pass from that time to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will be back in the earth. So Luke 21, and we'll pick up the record in verse 20. Jesus is speaking to his own disciples and he says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And Jesus is speaking about the Roman siege of Jerusalem which took place AD 66 to AD 70. When Jerusalem was compassed with armies. And then, for a short time, the Romans withdrew. And those who heeded the words of Jesus and this prophecy got out before the Romans came back and encircled the city again and, and completed the siege. And the Jews fell by the edge of the sword and were led away captive into all nations. And the Romans struck a coin to celebrate it. And on it it said, Judah captor, Judea captive. And they built the Arch of Titus. Some of you may have seen a picture of the relief on the Arch of Titus, which shows the Roman soldiers carrying the spoils that they'd gotten out of the temple in Jerusalem, including the seven-branch lampstand. Still there to this day. I, I was talking last week to a gentleman who visited Rome at a time when tourists could actually walk through the Arch of Titus. It's all railed off now. You can't get so close to it, apparently. Uh, and he walked under the Arch of Titus. And there in black chalk on the Arch of Titus was some graffiti written in Hebrew. It said, Yisrael al-Olam, Israel forever. Where's the Roman Empire? Gone. God said, I will make a full end of all those who carry you captive, but I won't make a full end of you. Where's Israel? Back in the land. So Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In 1967, when the Jews took the whole of the old city back, inaugurated the end times of the Gentiles. And then, said Jesus, verse 25, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Is that a description of our world? The word perplexity in, in the Greek means no way out. Sea and the waves roaring is a biblical figure for angry nations rising up. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. One of the statistics I saw last week in, in connection with the development of GM crops is the world's population is expected to double by 2035. And uh, 
those who are in the business say, well, we've got to find a way of feeding them. You know? All sorts of issues which, which man faces. And the fourth passage is the book of Revelation and chapter 11. We go right to the end of the Bible now. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. Revelation 11 verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shall destroy them which destroy, the margin says, corrupt the earth. There's a lot of angry nations in the Middle East at this time. There is great concern that man is corrupting the earth. He's corrupting the earth by polluting it, by destroying its resources. There are some who feel the earth is being corrupted morally as well, in all sorts of directions. This prophecy is also for the future, because it talks about the time of the dead being raised and judged, about God rewarding his servants who fear his name, See, there is hope in the Bible for those who will listen to God and obey him. So there's four prophecies. There are many, many more which speak about the current situation that we find in the world and particularly in the Middle East. So what is God going to do about it? Well, again, four passages. We're in Revelation 11, so just go back to verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. This is the end of a sequence of prophetic events which we have seen worked out in the world. The sounding of the first six angels can be identified with real historical events that have taken place. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. So here's one part of the purpose of God. That there's going to be a world government. One king, one kingdom. There won't be all these disparate kingdoms with their own objectives and their own religions and their own purposes, striving against one another. They're all going to be subsumed into the kingdom of God, ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you turn back to the Old Testament now and to the prophecy of Isaiah and again chapter 11, we find there a description of this ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the 11th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. And the Lord Jesus Christ, one of his titles is the son of David, which he is, biologically. So the stem of Jesse, this, this tree, is going to be hewn down and there's going to be a fresh shoot coming out of his roots a branch shall grow out of his roots and the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the lord and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the lord and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes nor reprove after the hearing of his ears but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth He's going to be an entirely righteous and just judge who won't have to rely on his eyesight or his hearing to reach his verdict because he will be able to see into the minds of men and women. And when somebody stands up and says something, he'll be able to say, you're lying. You are guilty, whatever your protestations of innocence. And that's what the world needs. Again, a couple of headlines in... Uh, in this week's news, a man released from death row after 30 years in prison.
for a murder which the prosecutor has now admitted he knew he'd never committed, but he wanted to get somebody convicted, and he sent this innocent man to jail. And he's been in jail for 30 years, now released with terminal cancer. And another headline, I haven't opened the story, but I saw the headline of a mother released from death row after 22 years, because it's now been established she didn't murder her child. It's a problem with human justice. Doesn't always get it right, but this one will. And not only will he judge aright, he will have the power. Middle of verse 4. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And that's what the world needs. And there is no power on earth that can intervene today and do that. But read on. Verse 5. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's going to be a different world. But it's not going to be a new world. God is going to restore the world to the way it was when he originally created it. Where he said that to every, every creature that he had created on the earth, to you of it, I have given every green herb for meat. They all ate vegetation. They weren't carnivorous and poisonous beasts in God's very good world as he created it. And it is God's purpose to restore those conditions on the earth. Something which man can't even dream of, let alone find a way of doing. So, Isaiah chapter 11. A restored and beautiful and, and perfect world. Move on now to Isaiah chapter 65 and, and see pictures of another aspect of that. Isaiah 65, and we go in at verse 17. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. See, th these powers that are around in the Middle East today, they're, they're trying to recreate former glories. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi wants to restore the Islamic Caliphate. The heads of state in the European Union are trying to recreate the empire of Charlemagne. Mr. Putin trying to get his Russian Federation brought together is trying to recreate the old glories of Tsarist Russia. They're all looking backward to, to past times of glory and saying, well, we, we want to get that back. God said, no, look forward. Look forward to the time when I'm going to create New heaven, and you won't be thinking about what's in the past then. Verse 18, be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And sadly, too often, that's just what happens in, in Jerusalem. You know, there was the incident a couple of weeks ago when a Palestinian drove a vehicle into a group of Israeli female soldiers. There was weeping and crying in Jerusalem, but no more. And verse 20, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And again, this is going back to conditions as they were in the beginning, when men lived to great ages, as recorded in Genesis chapter 5. Verse 23, They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it should come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. 
and dust shall be the serpent's meat, just as it was in Genesis 3. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Jerusalem will be at peace. Life for the inhabitants of this world will be prolonged and be pleasant, not torn by conflict and strife and warfare. Let's finally go now to our reading, to Psalm 72. Jonathan read the title of this psalm, A Psalm for Solomon, written, I believe, by David and given to his son Solomon, who was going to succeed him on the throne and rule over Israel. It's not just a psalm, it's a prayer. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountain shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. Let's stop there and think. There's going to be an election in this country in two months' time. You know, and the politicians are all gearing up for it, and the news is getting filled with all sorts of political statements and promises and so on and so forth. I challenge you to search the manifestos of all the parties to this election and see if you can find in any of them the word righteousness. You know, is Mr Cameron or Mr Miliband or Mr Farage or Mr Clegg or, or, or any of the others going to say, elect me and I will bring in righteousness. The basis of my administration will be righteousness. No, they, don't, they hardly understand the meaning of the word, let alone how to implement it. But this king will rule in righteousness. He will always do that which is right before God. Verse 4, he shall judge the poor of the people, shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. So he'll have the power to do it. And he's not just going to rule for 30, 40, maybe 50 years. Verse 5, they shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations, because the Lord Jesus Christ is now immortal. He will never die. Verse 7, in his day shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. That's what the world's crying out for. These peoples who rose up in the Arab Spring to try and overthrow their dictatorial, dictatorial rulers wanted a better standard of living. They wanted to live in peace rather than in fear of the secret police and so forth. None of them have got it because it's not in the power of man to do these things. But it will come. And the universality of the kingdom, verse 8, he shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. At the end of verse 9, his enemies shall lick the dust. Verse 11, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Verse 15, he shall live. And to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually. And daily shall he be praised. Because there's going to be one religion in the world. Centred in Jerusalem, yes. One religion. And, and all will come there to worship God and to praise the king. And verse 16, there shall be a handful, the Hebrew word actually means an abundance. There shall be an abundance of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. You won't need GM crops in the kingdom of God. There will be abundance of food for all. And his name, verse 17, shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and all nations shall call him blessed. That's the world that's coming. Psalm 72 is a description of life and conditions in the kingdom of God upon this earth. And these things will happen. There's abundant evidence for the truth of the Bible. We've seen just a little bit of it tonight. The world is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, filled by a race of people who have responded to God's offer of salvation, which he has recorded for us in the pages of the Bible. So our appeal to you tonight is read the Bible for yourself. Don't just take it because I've said it. Read it for yourself. 
come to understand and believe its message of salvation. Be baptized for the remission of your sin and walk in God's ways and wait for the coming of his son from heaven to be king of kings and lord of lords. Um, for, for what you've uh, said this evening. Um, you re referred um, to a lot of the conflicts being religious. I, I wonder what your thoughts are, um, uh, and you mentioned it in, in part, that within Islam, for instance, it, it is not a war of, of Islamists against Christians or other non-believers. A lot of them are fighting amongst themselves. Um, I, 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 and what, what, what do you feel, if you like, the scriptural significance of, of that might be? Because many moderate um, believers in Islam w would utterly condemn the violence uh, that, that is going on. Um, I, I, and yet, as a religion, that, that is utterly uh, divided against I itself. Um, and whether you see within that some fulfillment of Bible prophecy as well. Yes, I do. Um, first of all, just the history of why there is this conflict. When Muhammad died, the issue was who should succeed him. And there was a group which said, well, we want the most able and competent person that we have to become the, the, the head of this grouping that, that Muhammad had formed. And that man was Abu Bakir, who I mentioned in the talk, Muhammad's greatest, closest friend, who had fled with him from Mecca to Medina and had been with him all through the, the struggles and the, and the troubles that they had in getting what we now know as Islam off the ground. So Abu Bakir became the leader. But there was another group who said, no, 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 no. Anyone who succeeds Muhammad must be either a relative of his or an imam, a teacher, appointed directly by God. So their man was Ali, who was Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, married Muhammad's daughter. And they said, no, Ali is, is qualified to take over from Muhammad because he's part of the family. And the two groups fought, and Ali was killed. And the, the Shiites, and, and the, the word Shia in, in Arabic has got the name Ali in, embedded in it. They are the followers of Ali. The Shiites have never forgiven the Sunnis for killing Ali. Uh, and the Sunnis don't like the Shiites either because they believe that in the religion that the Shiites have developed over the years, there is idolatry as the Sunnis see it, which is why ISIS wants to destroy the holy cities um, in Iraq of the Shiites. So that's the historical background. Now, what about the Bible? Well, turn to Ezekiel 38 now, and, and let's see that these two groupings are actually identified in the pages of Bible prophecy. So Ezekiel 38, which I'm not going to attempt to expound in its totality, but Ezekiel 38 talks about a great invasion of the land of Israel, right? So you've got the phrase there in verse 18, the land of Israel. And this invasion comes from the north, right, into the land of Israel. Verse 15, thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. And verse 16, thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. So without going into political detail, this is an invasion of the land of Israel from the north. I believe it's headed up by Russia, and that verse 1 should read, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, which is Moscow, and Tubal, which is Tobolsk. But who are their allies? Verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. Persia, which today is Iran, is allied with this northern force that comes against Israel. And that's exactly where Iran is sitting politically today. It is allied with Russia. Russia helped them to build the nuclear reactor at Bushir. Mr. Putin has been to Tehran. He's talked to Ayatollah Khamenei, who's the spiritual leader of the Iranians. 
the Iranians and the Russians are on the same side. And that's what Ezekiel said they would be. But this invasion is, is protested against um, in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? Now, Sheba and Dedan, historically, geog geographically, are the Arab states at the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula. So Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, that, that, that grouping down there. And the merchants of Tarshish, Bible name for the British power. And if you want to understand how that works, talk to Matthew. I'm not going to attempt to repeat what he did at Prophecy Day last year. But isn't it interesting that Britain having withdrawn its naval powers in 1971 and closed down all its bases east of Suez, is now, has now found £15 million out of the depleted defence budget to build a naval base in Bahrain, right in the Persian Gulf, which puts Britain right in this position of, of chapter 13, of verse 13 of chapter 38. So, yes, the two groupings, the Shiites and the Sunnis, are identified within Ezekiel 38 and they're on opposite sides. Now come with me to Isaiah 60 and see what the end of it all is. Uh, I guess I really should have included this in the talk, but we'll look at it now. Isaiah chapter 60. And God speaking to Israel. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 3, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. End of verse 5, the forces margin the wealth of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. That's the people from the, the, the bottom end of the Arabian Peninsula. The queen of Sheba came to Solomon and brought... Gold and spices and incense, well, it's going to be repeated when Solomon's great descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, sits on the throne. And verse 7, all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. I believe that's the, the northern grouping, the Shiites, descended from Ishmael. And they're all going to come up to Jerusalem and worship. They already believe that there's one God. They call him Allah. They need to know that his name is Yahweh and that he's revealed himself in the Bible, not in the Quran. But that won't be a difficult lesson for them to learn. But they will all come and they will be part of the kingdom that's going to be set up when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So, so yes, Islam is definitely in the Bible. The origins of it are in Revelation chapter 9, which we won't look at now. Um, but the, the, these two groupings are clearly identified there, and their future is set out in Isaiah 60.